online, and it's good to see you here in the house. We are live streaming. It's good to see everyone today for chapter 24 of Acts. Last week, as you know, um, we covered chapter 23, one of my particular favorite chapters. Sad to say, things were lost to the wind because our sound system and tech was uh, down. Uh, the problem was found. Some solutions were uh, uh, craftily created, and we have audio again. That's a very, very good thing. My voice will uh, hold up much better today. But as much as I would love to repeat chapter 23, today is scheduled for chapter 24, and we will have to allude to it from time to time. But I encourage you, uh, if you missed that study, after this hour, review it. Read chapter 23 again. <coughs> the only side effect right now is to prevent gag, I must clear my throat. We are looking at chapter 20. Let me put on my glasses. We are looking at chapter 24 today and some highlights as you see. Ananias and Tertullus testify against Paul before Felix. Felix gives Paul an easy imprisonment uh, until Felix arrives, or I should say Festus, but Felix hears Paul. We'll have to clarify all of that. Things are happening in Paul's life. I mentioned before that there's so much activity going on. Acts is appropriately titled Acts because there's a lot of acts, action going on. And a lot of it is the act of the Holy Spirit. We see God's working in all of this. But for us, Things have slowed down just a little bit, and that may be a trial for Paul, unlike what he has seen before. <coughs> yeah, this is, uh, I had to look which mic that is. The other mic we had, uh, I'll, I'll, that's not a necessary detail, I'll share it later. Um, <coughs> when I read chapter 23, I wish that the post office had a time capsule mailbox so that I could and we could shower Paul with a lot of encouragement cards. He needs encouragement in this chapter, send it to that time. He needs encouragement in this chapter, send it to that time. When I read chapter 23, at one of his lowest points, that, that man needs encouragement. But you know something? We weren't able, we're not able to do that. And it may have happened too quickly for the church in Jerusalem to do that. But the Lord did that. Back in verse 11. That's so encouraging, back in verse 11, that the Lord came to him when he was desperately in need of encouragement just to hear a word of commendation. And the Lord says, you've spoken solemn, uh, uh, you've, you've testified of me solemnly in my name. That's beautiful. And then he also said something else. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost and all desires to go to Rome would never happen, Jesus said, oh, and you're going to do the same in Rome also. Amazing. Just in the last few seconds, I hear more feedback on behind me, uh, just to let the sound crew know in case that sound did not reverberate. Um, <clears throat> Paul had the best of intentions, but we remember chapter 23. Falsely accused. A mob brutality nearly beat him for dead. <clears throat> My apologies for that. It's going to apparently happen. He was arrested. He was thankfully protected by Roman law. It didn't start out that way, but it turned into that, thankfully. And he was on trial, and trial again. And he would be on trial and have to give this testimony time and time again. But he later learned about the plot against Paul. The commander learned, of that, not actually from Paul's nephew, about the plot to kill Paul. And in the way that I compare to Esther where just the right people are in the right place at the right time to share the right news, like Mordecai. Uh, I love this account, showing how God works to protect his people. Even while Jesus was telling Paul, you're going to make it to Rome, don't worry. Even at that moment, people were plotting to kill Paul. And the plan would have worked. I mean, it sounded, it sounded airtight. But God was involved. And when the commander heard of this, 400 and 70 plus of his best men <clears throat> were to escort one prisoner, Paul. And it looked like a, uh, like a logical, uh, normal, standard legal procedure. And that was wise because the mission was to sneak Paul out as fast as possible, as quiet as possible. And a lot of those men went to Antipatris, 
halfway checkpoint. Some of the soldier, most of the soldiers came back, but then the rest of them took them on into Caesarea. <clears throat> and that's where we are in chapter 24. Caesarea. Here's a perspective checkpoint, and I'll be doing some cold reading because the commentator did such a good job. We're basing this whole series, nine-month series, from the Truth for Today commentaries from David Roper, or I should say by David Roper, um, the Truth for Today resources, pages 367 and following. But the first paragraph, this is a perspective check now, and it essentially says, Think about Paul's journey to this point. He's always so busy, but he gets in prison. He gets you know, brought in, accused, and then he's released one way or another. He might spend a week in, in jail. He might spend a month or three months in jail. But this is unique in that from this point forward, the days and the weeks were turned into months, and the months were turned into year after year. That might have been hard for Paul because he was so busy going all over the place. But then again, it might be a blessing, a very... Bless, a great blessing in disguise for not only his body to heal <laughs> but also his mind to rest and focus on all that had been done and we'll mention a few other reasons why Luke might have been involved in uh, I mentioned earlier that some things had been written uh, don't get confused uh, the pastoral epistles probably were written during his time in Rome that wasn't what I was thinking so uh, uh, that's a little teaser for you Let's look at the text, chapter 24, verses 1 through 23. And that's the text that um, is categorized by Paul's trial before Felix. But in particular, let's hone it down to verses 1 through 9 first, 1 through 9. Commenting as we go, but focusing on some commentary or notes, uh, verse by verse, as needed. Um, remember when Felix, in chapter 23, verse 35, said to Lysias, uh, let me reverse that. Lysia says to Felix, um, here's the situation, and he's in your hands now. Well, Felix tells Paul, I will hear you when your accusers arrive. His accusers waste no time. Counting the time of travel for 60 miles, just enough time to get your act together and figure out what you're going to say and not say. In other words, to put a spin on truth. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 1. <coughs> All right. The accusation against Paul. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, um, people of the council. Some were Sadducees, some were Pharisees. With an attorney named Tertullus, attorney, an orator, a person of rhetoric. <laughs> And they brought charges to the governor against Paul. After Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying to the governor. Now, here's one commentator's note from another source, and just keep this in your mind. The Jews hated Governor Felix. We will share some details about this man from history. The Jews hated this man, and yet they have to be in his good graces. Tertullus is the one that showered, was paid to shower false flattery on him, doing what politicians do. Let's continue. Here he's what he says. Since we have, through you, obtained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out uh, for this nation, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness, but that I may not weary you any further. I beg you, grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. <clears throat> I'll, I'll be a little humorous here. Uh, in the mornings, my, my, my struggle is, is, is a sinus drainage gag reaction. But then I'm reading this. That alone is enough to induce that. Okay. Verse 5. <laughs> For we have found this man a real pest. That's not a soft word, cliche, like today. You're irritating me. No, this is like a word for plague, a, a nationwide pestilence that no one would want to put up with. And a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Hey, Romans and peace and Pax Romana and all that stuff. Um, that would capture his interest. And he was also wise. He no doubt uh, memorized this or memorized this and, thankful, and in his own way remembered to say it. 
and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Ooh. Oh, that's carefully worded. We'll talk about why. But verse 6. And he even tried to desecrate the temple. Oh, <clears throat> instead of had desecrated, try to. Hmm, that was toned down a bit. Easier, uh, easier to say, harder to prove or disprove. And then we arrested him. <laughs> Is that what you call that mob reaction? Hmm, okay. Your translation may or may not have this. We'll tell you why in a minute. We wanted to judge him according to our own law. So did Rome intervene and in, in what they said they would have allowed self-governance? That's a risky move. It's legally safe, but it's risky if you're telling the Roman commander here or, or the, the procurator of that area that it's their fault. <laughs> he isn't aware that what he's probably thinking at this moment <coughs> is that we all wish that would go away. But he's also probably not thinking of that about that letter that they didn't know of. Oh, so you wanted to kill Paul before the Romans intervened. That's what you really mean. But no, he didn't say that. Verse 7. But Lysias, the commander, came along and with much violence took him out of our hands. I've often wondered where that comes from. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Uh, ordering his accusers to come before you by examining him before yourself concerning all these matters you will be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. Huh. So the Jews also joined in attack, ascertaining that these things were so. Let me put it in practical application interpretation. Not that we have any evidence, but because we're saying this, we sure want you to believe it. On day number 58, back in our Five Minutes with God Devo book in Acts 24, uh, Rusty Hill says this, Ananias and the Jewish leaders were obviously more concerned with ridding themselves of Paul than they were with truth and justice. He says, I'm reminded of the words of Peter who instructs us to live with a clear conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And that's good advice. So many times that's the advice that I've, or approach I've had to take. In. And it's, it's a longer approach, but it sometimes works, uh, often works in that way. I'll say it that way. It works much more sweet when it does. Um, back on the commentary page, <clears throat> we, remind, we are reminded that uh, Paul is imprisoned in Herod's Praetorium. We shared some details about that uh, last time. It works out very good for Paul to have what I call a safe house. Yes, he's under arrest. Yes, he's probably limited, bound in some way, restricted, but compared to everything, or considering all that he had went through, ah, oh, this is a blessing. Chaos could be, and, and history tells us was, going on all around. There was revolts, there was trouble going on, contentions, riots, but Paul was safe. And that's a good thing. Two years in Rome, after two years in Caesarea, <clears throat> plus the subsequent time of travel, you're looking at two, uh, four and a half to five years from this point forward. Let's go to verse 1. I want you to imagine the scene of the Jews discovering the next morning that the person that they plotted to kill is no longer anywhere close. It was probably... He says, with great satisfaction that the officer told them that if you want to pursue this matter, you'll have to travel to Caesarea and present their case to Governor Felix. Oh, that was so fun. I, I would have loved to have seen that. Oh, I would have loved to have seen that. Ha ha on them. The Jewish leaders must have been enraged to have Paul escape their clutches again, but they were not ready to admit defeat, sad to say. Uh, the old priest was probably unhappy about traveling that far, but he was bent on exterminating Paul, so he did. They bought an attorney. They brought an attorney. And the word used here was retor. And you might have remembered the word rhetoric. It's an orator. Back then, public speaking for your cause is still as today in need. Um, but this orator was trained in legal persuasion. And incidentally, the English word for rhetor is a teacher of rhetoric. What does that mean? It means 
one who is persuasive in the use of language. <coughs> I am all about, and I firmly believe that we should become the best communicators possible, especially when we're telling people about the gospel, the most important news there is. But we all know that persuasive speech doesn't always pair up with truth. I'd like to share something to you, a quote I remembered, and I wrote it down so I could say it just right. Some people's convictions are so underdeveloped or immature that they are most easily swayed by the last persuasive argument or speech they hear or the one that moves them most emotionally. Of course that's how people are. If you aren't rooted in principle, focused on truth, you'll be swayed by rhetoric. And Felix is one trained to not be swayed by rhetoric. That's at least a plus. The sad thing is he's not rooted in principle at all. So those two things are, you know, you, you put a coin on the edge, you spin the coin, and which side's going to fall? We'll find out. Um, the Jews probably secured the services of this skilled speaker because he would be more familiar with Roman law, and it, uh, the commentator said they probably would have choked on the flattery needed to be spoken. Yeah, they didn't like Felix one bit, and within a decade, Felix would go down for it. <clears throat> Verses 2 and 3. Felix, the Roman procurator of Judea. <coughs> My apologies forever. Um, from time to time, Judah was governed by procurators. When we think of a procurator of Judea or Jerusalem, what are we thinking of? We're thinking of Pilate. He was certainly the most famous. But here in Acts, we have a couple mentioned, and Felix is one of them. Felix did put down a couple rebellions. However, um, the way it was done was ruthless, and it enraged even the most moderate of Jews. Some key points from history. Whatever peace existed was in spite of him, not because of him, some people have said. Felix, however, was both judge and jury, and Tertullus would say anything to win their side. In verse 4, let your eyes glance over that text and notice three charges against Paul. Three charges. I've also learned something else. Let's see, that's my mask. Sorry about that. Better to go this way than down the throat and gag again. <coughs> okay. Charge number one. A personal charge. For we have found this man a pest. No one in their right thinking would want this man to even live. Next charge is political who stirs up dissensions, a ringleader of the Nazarenes. Well, Felix would certainly be concerned with the reputation of Romans' peace. Hmm, ironically, though. The accusation had an element of truth because wherever Paul went, there was disorder. But as you well know, sometimes the person blamed is not the one to cause or at fault. Note the ringleader of the Pharisees, or I should say the ringleader sect of the Nazarenes as the, as the word. The word sect comes from a word in which we get heresy. Heresy. <coughs> I'll have to make a comment now. The former mic we had had just one mute button to push, and it's instantly silenced, lifting up, and it's back on. I miss that button for this reason so much. The term Nazarenes, heresy of the Nazarenes, was accurately chosen because they hated Christ. And you remember the phrase, the reputation of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of, out of there? And it lingered a bit. So it was probably suggesting that Christianity was an illegal religion. You know, there's always meanings to words. I hope that this assembly is able to determine or discern how headlines are worded um, to make you feel like, uh, or to make you think as though you should feel a certain way about the, what they're about to report on. Headlines are vital. People are paid a lot of money to word headlines. 
And in the same way, this lawyer is earning his money for his job to word everything just right so that all the negative connotations are attached to their cause against this man. And to go a little bit deeper and suggest that Rome should take care of Christianity. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. I mentioned earlier that uh, in the first part of verse 6, we know that for sure is in the text, the original manuscripts that Luke wrote, uh, the attorney made a pious charge. Here's the third one, a pious charge. And he tried to desecrate the temple. Hmm. Earlier, it was Paul had. If he had, there would have been evidence or people to testify. Where did they go? They disappeared, those Asiatic Jews. Where are they at? Who knows? But now it was softened to just saying he tried. That's a charge that is vague. It's harder to prove or disprove. Commentator said, Rome had given temple authorities the right to execute any who defiled the temple. That was one of the stipulations that Rome allowed the Jewish people for their limited rule. Self-governance, I should say. Um, just because the Jews didn't put up much of a fuss in Palestine when uh, Pompey conquered it, doesn't mean that they were happy. Um, they were known for being the worst to deal with. <coughs> okay. Verses 6b through, 6, uh, through 8a. Um, we'll first deal with it as though it is in the text and then explain the textual criticism in a minute. He says, we arrested him and we wanted to try him according to our own law. Ah, so that's the approach you're taking. But Lysias, the commander, came and with much violence took him out of our hands. I think there was already a lot of violence. He left that detail out ordering his accusers to come before you. Well, again, this man's pretty smart. It just happens to not be the honest version. The lawyer likely did not know that Felix had in his possession the statement from Lysias that he had to rescue Paul from the Jews who were trying to kill him. I'm thankful that little bit of knowledge was in his head. It's easier to combat error when you already know the truth. Note the bracket before the phrase, we wanted to. Is that in your translations, the one you're holding? I don't know. <clears throat> Is it somehow offset or marked or italicized? There's a reason why. Textual criticism, this is a class that's necessary to share. It's, um, it's not saying, I doubt the Holy Spirit. I doubt inspiration. I doubt that we have what we need to know for salvation and all that other stuff. Textual criticism is simply ascertaining the validity of the recorded text um, and knowing what we have is holy writ. Um, and there are ways to know this. <coughs> translations are based in, this is an oversimplification, translations are based in certain groupings of texts, dating, date-wise and geography-wise, geographically speaking. Um, and, and that's a great study. I think Ron has taught on that in years past, but here's another oversimplification. The older the text, the better. Less chance for human uh, influence. There are some cherished translations that do not depend on the oldest texts um, and sometimes reflect the language of the day and time in which it was translated words change and I don't want to go I, and I'm already going too far into this but this is a good case study to know whether or not and it doesn't matter either way because it doesn't matter either way whether this was in Luke's writing or not but since it's offset I'm having enjoyably uh, having to explain why let me read well worded to statements by David Roper um, did the footnote later by a scribe get into the scripture since there is insufficient textual evidence for the gene genuineness of this reading. Most translations do not include it today, but relegate it to brackets, at least, as a footnote or something similar. The KJV, following the Western text, has the passage without brackets. Interesting. Regarding his own translation in his commentary of Acts, Simon uh, Kitzmaker explained, the Western reading has a ring of authenticity. 
Hence, I do not wish to bar its inclusion, but I judiciously place it within brackets. And F.F. Bruce agreed. These are people who study their whole life of this stuff. And he says, the tone of the Western edition is so thoroughly in accord with the rest of Tertullus' speech that, it is, that, that one is inclined to accept it as genuine. And, and that, that's cool. I hope you enjoy that textual study because you look at it and, and try to read it sometime with it and try to read it without it and see how the intent is explained. But does the orator always explain the intent or depend on the wording uh, to be clear with or without it. it. It doesn't matter either way, and that's why it's fun to talk about it in this case. But one factor does come in. He says, by examining him, at verse 8b, by examining him yourself, you will know all these matters to be true. Now, it does make a difference as to who him is. If you take it out, then him is Lysias. Go, go ask Lysias. Go ask Lysias. That's a tongue twister. But if it's in the text, then it's Paul. So it, again, really doesn't matter because all the pronouns and the whole other and the rest of his speech refer to Paul. So he's likely gesturing towards Paul when he's saying this. And they were likely hoping because they didn't have any evidence that Paul's own words would incriminate him. But Paul is a, well, smart man. <laughs> and at this point, I believe he would be inspired as well. Um, uh, let's go down to verse 9. We're targeting verse 9. The high priest and the elders likely uh, shouted in agreement. As we get into, let's see, verses 10 and 12, 10 through 21, here's what to listen for. Paul had no attorney, but as an expert in Jewish law and a Roman citizen, he was familiar with Roman law as well. The contrast between Paul's opening statement and Tertullus' is, uh, is striking. Paul was courteous and factual, but avoided any flattery. All right, let's notice the difference and let our ears appreciate hearing sound reason. Verse 10, when he had nodded for Paul to speak, he responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge of this nation, I cheerfully make my defense, since you can take note. Why was he cheerful that he was talking to someone in rule for many years? Here's why, verse 11. Since you can take note of the fact that no more than, and he'd start listing from this present time backwards, that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. To worship, not to cause trouble, but to worship. Neither... In the, uh, neither in the temple nor in the synagogues nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. Remember those purification feasts or uh, uh, rituals that he participated in? Um, some people think that he should not have done that, but it worked out to be a blessing that because he did, he was able to say this, and he was extra careful to make sure he didn't carry on conversation with anyone too soon. There's a time for that because you're in where? Jerusalem of all places. Verse 13. <clears throat> <clears throat> Nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you that according to the way, Paul says the way, which they call a sect, a heresy, I do serve the God of our fathers. He's including them. Believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is within, written within the prophets. Remember, that's the tone in which um, uh, previously in Jerusalem got him furious enough to, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? It's just before the strike. It's, it's not the word he said Gentiles before the strike, but, but these are words they are absolutely hating to hear. Because they want to think that they're superior and that they have the law all, all together and that Paul's the one who's a heretic. But what he is saying right here, he, they're having such a hard time holding still their tongues. And, hoping, and having a hope in God, which these men, likely referring to the Pharisees of the group, since they believed in the resurrection, which these men cherish themselves, that they shall certainly be 
a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Hmm, he included the wicked this time. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, uh, conscience before God and men. Well worded, Paul. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms. Now, he, Paul is addressing charge by charge, charge by charge. He's already dealt with two of them. This is the third one about causing a ruckus everywhere. But this is his evidence against the third charge. But he's also talking to a very corrupt man. So take those factors involved. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms, money, to my nation and to present offerings, donations, in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. <clears throat> but there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make the accusation if they should have anything against me. Obviously, they're not here. Or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council. Good one. Reminding them again that they cannot. Um, last time, it was just when he said, I lived in good conscience before God and men to this day. Strike them. <clears throat> Other than for this one statement, which I shouted while standing among them. Oh, they're about to hear this statement again, and this time they have to be quiet. I can't help. It's obvious which side I'm on. For the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. But Felix, having a more exact knowledge of the way, what does that phrase mean, more exact knowledge? We'll get to it. Uh, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. Even though Paul should have been freed, justly freed at this very moment, and the other one's put in jail. Guess what? Sadly, it didn't turn out that way, but in one way I count my blessings, and I mourn the consequence of having uh, worldly people in, in those positions. Um, this was a genius play by Felix. We know him as a procrastinator, for sure, and a Jewish pleaser, and yet I... He, he didn't balance that out too well, but this was a good play. It, it was a way to say, we can continue this when he comes back down, but it likely never occurred. History has no, we have no knowledge of that request for Lysias to be sent for ever occurring or that the trial ever taking place. We have no record of that. So this is a way of saying, I'll just put it off and keep you quiet. Because every two years, well, in this case, in two years, he'd be replaced. Um, and really, Felix did nothing. It was a way to do nothing. It wasn't the right approach. But there were a lot of uh, politics involved. Um, verse 23 um, then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. Uh, that's a good thing. That was common when you're, you're not really a bad, bad, bad criminal. So that was, this was good. This gave time for people to come and go and um, visit Paul and encourage him and others to, to visit and see what all is taking place and what should be transcribed. Verse 11, uh, just a few notes on that. Um, much of the 12 days Paul had spent in jail, leaving little time to cause trouble. Uh, okay, I already mentioned that. I'm sorry, I started too soon. There's a lot of these details that I highlight happily, and then in the moment I realized time goes by too quickly. And in a way, I always said all that stuff. It's in my head. That's good. Okay. One commentator said, referring to verse 14, let's skip to verse 14. Erasing the picture of, that Tertullus had painted of him as a radical, Paul noted that the roots of the way were in the soil of Judaism. Both, religious, uh, both religions believe in one God, embrace the law and the prophets, and believe the resurrection of the law. And this is good. David Roper says, Paul, <clears throat> um, this is a quote actually that he puts from Warren Worsby. Paul and the earlier Christians did not see themselves as former Jews, but as 
fulfilled Jews. Now, that's not how the, the, the staying Jews would see the Christians, heretics. But those who heard, studied, believed, and followed Christ as the fulfillment of the law, they see them as accomplished. And they look to the Jews and say, why don't you all get it yet? Mm. Okay, verse 16 he says, I stand before you an innocent man. That's essentially what he says. And I try hard to stay on the right side of all good things. And oh, if every, if every person were to live in light of the judgment. He says, the reason I stand before you an innocent man and try my best to be accountable in all things is because of that great day of reckoning, that great day of accountability. And oh, if everyone lived with that in mind. Verse 17 would Paul have been freed had he not spoken about the resources for, that allowed him to be so benevolent? I, I don't know. That, that's something to think about. He says, after several years, about five years, actually, he references his last trip, I returned to bring alms and help them out. Now, that's a technical truth. He did come with a lot of money for Jews, certain Jews. And have you ever noticed that uh, some people are this way, some people aren't? My mind is this way, but I often don't say it. Uh, I call them the detail correctors. Uh, sometimes it's just not wise to share all the details. You'll, you'll uh, dilute the potency of the point. And Paul is simply saying a generic truth. I brought alms to bless them. <clears throat> and that's the truth. Details would have hurt in this case. To summarize verses 17 through 21, one commentator said, the charge of blasphemy was without merit. Why would Paul go to the temple to comply with the ordinances for sacrificial offering and give alms to the poor and then defile the temple by taking a Gentile with him? This would have destroyed his credibility as a rabbinic scholar and, of course, his purpose for being there. So it doesn't make any sense. Uh, integrity is his testimony. Felix uh, must have picked up on the word alms, though. And uh, because of his family connections, uh, his, his three-wife succession marrying to go up the social ladder of success, uh, no small sum would have been uh, good enough to bribe Paul out. Um, he apparently met often for that purpose. And so uh, Paul was not about to um, bribe his way out, nor was he going to misuse the Lord's funds or appropriate more funds for his own freedom. Uh, nor would he make any excuse to say, well, I could preach the gospel more easily if, I, if I'm out of this confinement. Mm -mm. No, God's way, is, he's, he's going to do God's way. And he embraced, actually, this concept of whatever's happening at this moment, uh, even if it's not right, it must be a, you know, God's allowance. So in God's providence, he will take care of me. So Paul was never going, in all of these subsequent meetings that he had, was never going to be with uh, succumbing to, to that bribe. But Felix sure wanted that. And here's, uh, ooh, you know what? I was just thinking, ooh, ooh, ooh. There is one Sunday where I have, towards the end, free and open. And you know what I'm doing? I'm looking at this here. Yeah, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at how much text we got left. And I'm looking at how much time we don't have. Hmm. I may give you five extra minutes of fellowship today because I do not want to rush the um, testimony that Paul is giving to Felix, nor do I want to um, minimize the impact of Felix's internal terror by telling you his statement in response. I want to build the drama to this. So this will be the chapter that I have to break into two in order to give proper time and attention to. We will uh, fill whatever time remains next week with um, proper material, but we have so many applications along the way. And I just realized I've kept that screen up this whole time. I'm telling you, medications may help in one way, but I'll call it a glitch in the other. Let me click to where we're supposed to be. That works. That works. Applications of the text, um, that's going to be fun. That's going to be next week. But let's just go ahead and encourage you to uh, mark down class 32 as chapter 24b 
All right, I'm feeling good up here. Uh, sinus drainage is a nuisance. Not, if you think you're annoyed, you just think about how annoyed I am. It's not easy to do this up here. So I'm looking forward to uh, the sermon today. It's going to be very different, and I'm looking forward to telling you more about Felix and his response. And, oh, this man was a mess. I'm just going to tell you, this man was a mess.